Thank you for being here this evening. Thank you for trauma care, uh, Sir Keith Porter in particular. Um, I hope you came across uh, this and uh, sent across the invite. So I'm really grateful to be here. So uh, let's crack on. Yeah, part one, the elephant on the road, emotions in pre-hospital care. And uh, like Anna mentioned uh, in the intro, um, you know, there's a lot of talk always about clinical uh, aspects of care. But I like that she mentioned also care of the trauma victim. Um, you know, it's so important uh, to think about the wider experience of uh, trauma and critical care. Um, so, uh, um, which is why um, I decided to delve into this uh, area of research and an interest and um, deliver these sessions. So just a quick outline then of uh, what the tonight's session is gonna be about. I'll just give a bit of a background as to who I am and what I do and uh, why I delved into this area of research. And then uh, just a quick outline of the format of tonight's session. So uh, the, the big thing that I'm gonna be delving into is uh, what I've called the emotional cycle of healthcare provision. So it's something that I developed after doing some research research looking at the challenges pre-hospital care practitioners experience with pediatric care. Uh, yeah, it's a bit of a mouthful, uh, but um, uh, you'll see what I mean uh, more, more as uh, we go on. Um, and then I'll do a quick summary and then I'll also signpost some resources and uh, our own health and well-being, our own emotions, because um, there will uh, possibly be quite a few triggers, uh, as I mentioned, a few examples and case studies throughout the whole session. Um, so yeah, just a quick background then as to who I am. So I'm currently a paramedic uh, based in the UK. So that's my clinical background. But I've got experience in lots of different settings. Uh, so pre-hospital care, my primary role right now is in telemedicine. Uh, but I also work in events and I've done lots of different things, um, uh, teaching, education, uh, youth and voluntary work, uh, the outdoors. So lots of different backgrounds to draw from, uh, which I think is pretty vital. Um, and it's kind of brought me to doing this in the first place. So uh, um, just a bit more context uh, in terms of this, that's what brought me into uh, clinical sciences and then uh, focusing on this. The common thread throughout my, all my degrees and my research has been um, um, health and well-being, societies and cultures. So I think that kind of background and context really helped me um, think more widely and more broadly about the non-clinical aspects of our care from day one as a student paramedics I, I was able to ask more questions make uh, wider considerations about things that someone who just goes into the field or might not have that wider background or context uh, would ask and do um, and uh, right now um, I'm actually doing a diploma conflict catastrophe for medicine uh, so humanitarian medicine is kind of my thing right now uh, and again there's a lot of trauma both uh, clinical and non-clinical there um, so, yeah, uh, I might have mentioned earlier on, um, a lot of this uh, was inspired by uh, some work, uh, some research literature that I did looking at pre uh, pre pediatric care, but I'm not going to be delving into that. Um, if anyone wants a copy of what I did, you can always hit me up. Uh, I will leave my details at the end of the session. Uh, instead, what I'm going to do is share the key lessons uh, from the review and introduce this model because essentially what I think this model does for people is it, it, it provides a framework, like a map uh, for people to start um, identifying their own journey, their own emotional journey when we're providing uh, care in any kind of context and setting ready. Um, um, so yeah, that's the key thing with this session. So like I said, uh, a, a trigger warning, there's a range of topics that I may end up discussing. Uh, we'll talk about suicide, death, stress, anxiety, depression, PTSD, relationships, health and well-being. So it's a wide range of topics. Um, so at any point, uh, if it's becoming too much, please do feel free to step aside. Like Anna said, the session will be available later on uh, to stream uh, via Trove Care website and YouTube. Um, and uh, yeah, you can always hit any of us up uh, if you had any further questions or do you want to discuss anything. 
Um, so, uh, 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 like I said, a uh, bit more uh, detail than about the uh, background and inspiration uh, behind this research. It all started in um, my first year as a student paramedic. So I think it was probably like my 11th shift or something like that. Um, so I had my first cardiac arrest um, and, it, and uh, the patient was actually a child, a two-year-old female. Mm -hmm. So um, it was quite a big dunking into the deep end really because I didn't really have any baseline or any kind of context as to what to expect and how it would unfold and, and evolve. But the big thing that really stood out to me with the whole experience, uh, the whole patient encounter, that's what we're talking about tonight, is how emotionally intense it was before, during and after the encounter. Um, and what it really highlighted to me was how emotions impacted um, our well-being and performance throughout all phases. Um, yeah, there were things uh, that went wrong, could have been uh, done better clinically, but I really um, saw in so many different ways how emotions were actually shaping the practice, uh, the approach of all those clinical aspects in the first place. Um, so ever since then, uh, I retain an interest in what you call high intensity, low frequency areas of pre-hospital care thereafter. And I kept seeing these common themes um, throughout a lot of encounters. Um, I picked uh, pediatric, uh, I picked children young people because of so many emotions that uh, are, um, revolve around children young people, but uh, ultimately it's, it's relative. Uh, anyone can have any kind of patient encounter and it can be high intensity uh, for them, something of low frequency, but more of emotionally intense. Um, so just a couple of things in relation to uh, challenges in paramedicine in terms of a wider context. Right now, I think uh, in terms of practice, there's a reluctant informal awareness and appreciation, you know, of how emotions are significant. Hence why I call it the elephant on the road, because um, it's something that we're aware of. Say, for example, if you went to a really sick, unwell child and then you're in the crew room and then someone will mention it, there'll be a silence. It'll be like, whoa, you know, um, so there's, there is that kind of informal awareness, but it's still a taboo. I don't think there's enough formal acknowledgement and action really uh, around how emotions play a big part of our practice. It's slowly growing and improving, but I think there's still a long way to go. Uh, practitioners are well-intentioned. Now I put an asterisk uh, with practitioners because for me, it's important to acknowledge um, all clinicians whether they're professional or non-professional, we all uh, have a role to play. Uh, I don't believe in hierarchies and titles, so I like to capture everyone because it's important to do so. So yeah, um, we're all well-intentioned. Many people really want to do well uh, for the people in the care. We're just not always in the best position to address the challenges that we have, both clinical and non-clinical. And we have to accept this and sometimes we have to just make do and I'll, I'll demonstrate how. Um, and yeah, uh, training, research and policy, um, uh, again, like I mentioned uh, in the blurb of the webinar, but so much emphasis and investment is given to the clinical aspects of our care to pr uh, improve performance and practice. But in my view, and I don't think I'm alone in this, pre-hospital care is largely about optimising the scene, uh, the environment, and interaction between people to make the medicine happen. So that's all the foundation to make the care optimal. Um, so the non-clinical aspects. Um, and I think that we, we as a as a field, uh, we've got a, a long way to go really um, to address that sufficiently. Um, and lastly, uh, just in terms of mental health and well-being. Uh, there's so many stats that show anxiety, stress, depression are leading causes of staff sickness and resignation. Um, I put it there as well by experiencing trauma. Uh, a lot of this is preventable and just, but sometimes irreparable damage end up happening to staff and, and it's not really fair. Uh, but there is a growing need and recognition for change and hopefully sessions like tonight, uh, you lot just turning up 
uh, and being willing to just listen to this conversation and engage some thoughts um, is part of that way for change. Uh, so here we are then. Um, so now we're giving you a bit of a context and background. Let's delve into the cycle itself. Um, so we've got three phases. Uh, I've mapped it out temporarily, but before you've got a preparation phase. So you've got your call, you've got your job, you're going to start making your way there. Um, um, or if it's telemedicine, you'd be looking at the list of jobs and you'll see what you've got. Um, and then during, um, so this is the big phase really where we're actually with our patients and their family or with the scene. Uh, so uh, we perform emotional labor and I'll delve into a bit more what that means. And then after any kind of patient encounter, we uh, practice and experience and perform what I'd call emotional process. <laughs> Um, so yeah, they're the three phases and this is the emotional cycle. Uh, sometimes I also call it the emotional cycle of a patient encounter. It's essentially uh, everything you do and draw upon to be ready for your patient encounter. What does it entail? First of all, it's our health and well-being, so how well we are. Um, um, and uh, I, 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 let me just summarize this and I get into it a bit more. Uh, the second part of preparation is our training exposure and experiences not just um, on that day but we're talking a bit more long term and then delving into like what preparation actually encompasses we've got pre-arrival preparation practices so routine versus non-routine and this is what a lot of the literature actually focuses on so uh well-being living well uh so these are a few of the things that um are, are, are gonna shape us you know in that uh before phase so your physical fitness first of all but also your relationships and it's not only just uh within uh the workplace so uh, if you're an ambulance it's with your crewmate it's uh um how your relationships are with the the, the staff on station but uh what i'll be delving into part two uh, a lot more is beyond the workplace you know so uh, how your relationships beyond the workplace they can actually uh, affect how you are your mood etc uh, when you on on the job on a shift economics of living uh, again i'll delve into that more in part two an interest in fulfillment from work you know so if you're ready 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 to go if you're feeling enthusiastic yeah that's gonna shape how well prepared you are but if you've had a run of bad shifts or or, or you're just fed up it's gonna really uh, impede your preparation but um in a nutshell you just goes to show already when i've broken that down there's so many things that will shape uh, our practice and moreover import, uh, shape our emotional well-being and performance second part is training exposure experience so when i'm talking about training i'm talking about education learning development and it's not just anything in an informal setting but it's also an informal saying you know as as you go on through the role you're always learning experience and training but ultimately yeah it's it's uh um, that formal training um, that we actually experience, and then exposure and experience. This is more, again, in the workplace. You know what, what past encounters we had. But I want you to remember this because uh, mm -hmm. it's really important. I want to emphasize this: life experiences, um, especially in pre-hospital saying, we draw upon our initiative, our own, own uh, life experiences, to be ready to perform emotional labor, to process things, and I'll demonstrate as we go on why that's both a good thing and a bad thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, just speaking about training, exposure, and experience. Um, uh, uh, you, you might have noticed in any kind of corporate language, for instance, um, you know, with a lot of ambulance services, we're no longer emergency services, we're emergency and urgent care services. And with that means we have a greater sense of responsibility and scrutiny. We need to be ready to be able to deal with a huge, wide range of things. Um, I, I have to be careful in case I call the fence, but, you know, sometimes I'll say, you know, pre-hospital clinicians, we're mobile GPs because we deal with such a broad range of things. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so we're expected to be able to deal with a lot more. Our scope is big and um, a lot of the language in that, uh, you know, uh, you, you get things like safeguarding, think family approach, or you get, you know, patient centered care. But uh, bottom line is um, all these different concepts and terms, what are they talking about? They talk, they, they, they're highlighting how emotional aspects are vital, ethical. Uh, they're going to make our care more productive and effective. 
Um, so because that's being recognized in that education and training, it's also being used to audit and uh, scrutinize us. There is an expectation that we actually be able to have to be able to deliver on these aspects of care. But what is the problem? What is the challenge? Uh, firstly, um, a, a lack of exposure, uh, training and practical experience. Um, so uh, especially when it comes to, uh, you know, these high intensity low frequency areas like pediatric care like obstetric care um so although we've got an expanding scope and more expectations you know there is an argument that we still not got enough training exposure and experience so if you're getting a job i'm like oh i've not been to this before that can fuel a lot of stress and anxiety you can feel lack of confidence you can feel uncomfortable so already you know we're in our emotional cycle we're in that first phase and before we've even got to the scene uh we're not really feeling prepared you know emotionally we're not fully totally there um and therefore like i mentioned if you've not got enough training um um uh, or education uh we then forced to draw upon our personal experience and our ad hoc knowledge in order to uh, make do and, and uh, do the best that we can once we arrive uh, on scene. Um, and then the other thing uh, here as well that's important to mention when it comes to the experience aspect is the influence of Im uh, unprocessed emotional baggage. And I'll talk more about that when it comes to emotional processing. But just say, for instance, if you go into a job um, and you've had a similar job before, that's already going to knock you back potentially. So if you had any bad uh, past jobs or calls, or if it's a frequent caller, then already that's going to be affecting your mood. Um, and then finally, um, in terms of this uh, initial phase, we got uh, pre-arrival preparation practices routine. So what does pre-arrival involve? Uh, um, you, you, you say if you're on a truck, you, you get a call through your MDT, get some details, uh, or you might be uh, um, uh, handing over uh, at hospital and then you're getting your vehicle ready and then you might get some information for a job and then it's also driving um, to the, the call itself and then it's having a discussion uh, a, a briefing um, uh, with your crewmate if you're not alone and then um, a non-routine um, so uh, again if it's something that's uh, uh, an a, a call or a job that you're not entirely familiar with. Uh, let's go along with the example of a pediatric cardiac arrest. Um, then you can already feel unprepared and ill-equipped. And again, what a lot of the research shows, but also I think I'm sure a lot of you lot can uh, resonate with is um, you, when you feel unprepared and ill-equipped, what people will tend to do, they'll think about both the clinical and non-clinical aspects um so what um, many will do you you got your phone you got your jr card for instance or you might have any other kind of uh pocketbook or, or, or algorithm but people will mention you will be review hypothetical scenarios all right so so when you go in i'll take this bit of kit or you take that bit of kit and then i'll do this first and i'll do that first and essentially what um people are doing in these instances are um they, 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 they're trying to reframe their focus. So the emotions are there, but by having a plan and being prepared, that kind of helps them um, um, enact what we call emotional distancing. So we're trying to put the emotions aside, be aware of them, but make sure that they don't impede so we can be prepared and actually deliver some kind of effective care. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, that's the first phase then, uh, before, so the preparation phase. The key thing just to uh, um, uh, note here is uh, practitioners aren't always uh, ready and well purpose of, of practice. There are uh, a few challenges there that relate uh, to various different aspects, A, to themselves as an individual, B, in terms of like the wider system, setting environment and the education and training that they received. Uh, now, moving on uh, to phase two, uh, which is during, um, so uh, emotional labour. What does emotional labour mean? It means practitioners managing their own 
and others' ideas, feelings, thoughts, and expressions to fulfill their role effectively. You know, so we talk a lot about, uh, okay, you know, clinical care, you know, we're going to do a a patient assessment, primary survey, we're going to give these drugs, go do some paperwork, we might need to do an assessment. But throughout that, as soon as we arrive and say, hello, we're developing a rapport. And there's so many other things that we do that encompass uh, what we call emotional labor. And it does actually take a lot of skill um, and a lot of energy. Um, So let's delve into it a bit more. So I'll talk about some examples in practice, what emotional labor means to patients and then the challenges uh, we practitioners experience with it. So first of all, like I said, uh, it's important to mention that emotional labor is something that we perform for ourselves, our colleagues, uh, patients and their families. Um, so it's providing and receiving information, it's consoling people, uh, reassuring people. So, you know, you, you get it in, again, um, um, in a lot of trusts and organisations, you've got your values, how many um, empathy, compassion. Um, so again, there's an expectation for us to be able to demonstrate these things. But when we... When we um, providing pain management it's not just about providing a, a drug uh, that reassurance consoling emotional wa- uh, labor but if someone is uh, mentally unwell experiencing uh, a mental health crisis again that can uh, demand a lot of labor and then going to the the more um prominent examples i guess you can call it palliative and life care um Again, uh, when you're having a holistic ethos and approach, you're having to think about these other aspects a, a, a lot more. Breaking bad news, uh, again, to highlight is death, only the bad news. Whenever we go to see someone, you know, giving them a new diagnosis or prognosis uh, or they're experiencing some kind of change or, or, or a loss or something's getting worse, the, you could almost argue these are breaking bad news. And again, we're having to perform labor. We're not just giving this information, um, but um, we're always having to uh, console and reassure. And again, this is emotional labor. We're not just uh, giving information. Motion, that takes a lot from us. And to do that well, it, it requires a great uh, level of skill. And then, uh, as I mentioned before, pediatrics and obstetrics. Again, there's so many emotions uh, surrounding these areas. And uh, one further example that's been a recent change in the last couple of years, uh, is when it comes to uh, uh, newborns, babies. Um, so there's been recent change um, in guidelines around preterm babies. Um, so this providing clinical bed, but then there's comfort focused care. So any uh, preterm babies under 22 weeks. And this is emotional labor completely as in you're providing information but you're not doing any kind of clinical interventions and it's been interesting you know hearing about the challenges and the dynamics uh when people have had these situations but i think it it, it again goes show and highlight why there's such an important need for emotional labor to be understood and recognized but also again how it's a big part of our role um, so just a few quotes. I, I find quotes uh, to be uh, quite powerful, uh, but uh, they just um, underline that or what I said about uh, what emotional labor means to patients. So uh, the quote here said, the way to help someone feel better is to let them be in pain. Um, and then the human soul doesn't want to be advised or fixed or saved. It simply wants to be witnessed, to be seen, heard and companioned exactly as it is. Uh, sometimes, quite often, um, you know, people don't just simply want a, a diagnosis. So you might have, you know, come across the acronym ICE, uh, you know, ideas, concerns, expectations, you know, why, why are we here? What, what would you like from us? Quite often people just want to be uh, acknowledged, that understood, that, um, you know, oh, I, I am in pain or oh, I'm finding this difficult. Uh, and, um, Sometimes, you know, uh, they, they just want someone to allow them to be able to express and share that. And uh, it makes such a huge difference um, uh, to their own experience of that encounter when sometimes you just allow them to be. So if someone is crying, instead of telling them to stop crying, uh, maybe let them cry for a short period of time. Let them just express how they're feeling uh, because not only will it, 
uh, just give them the space to be themselves. It'll help you understand uh, what the whole thing means to them. And, and when with that understanding, you can help address their needs uh, better. Um, so, and again, uh, you can go into this in so much more detail, but, uh, well, let's look at a lot of uh, maternity reports that have been recently coming around, uh, whether it's coming to uh, traumatic births, or, or the maternity inquiries and again one of the things that's common throughout is uh, they weren't listened to or respected or acknowledged but how is such a big important part of the experience so yeah um we're we're aware of this uh, um, and we try to do this but again it's not easy it's not straightforward but nevertheless it's a big part of our, our role and uh, and one last uh, quote um that I remember from my younger years, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And I think it's so true. Uh, if I was to flip it uh, just as a practitioner and uh, look at uh, the people I've cared for, patients, and when I look back, um, quite often the people that I do remember is those uh, who touched me, uh, who made me feel a certain way. Um... And it, and it goes vice versa. So, um, yeah, it's a it's a big part of our practice. And if we can do it well, we can make a difference for every, uh, um, an important concept when it comes to emotional labor. It's something called PFCC that's mentioned in a lot of literature. But it's essentially what you call patient-centered care, or in this case, patient and family-centered care. Um, and this is delved a bit more in, I guess, I'm drawing upon uh, from uh, my research. But what is trying to highlight is um, how everyone is almost a patient. It's important to engage and in, involve everyone. And again, this is part of uh, performing in emotional labor. Uh, but the, the challenge that we always have um, when it comes to uh, this this phase of performing emotional labour, is we can't just spend uh, so many so much time on scene. Um, we can't just let someone cry for so long, or or let them or, or give them a counselling session as such. Um, the bottom line, what I'm saying here is. Uh, uh, as pre-hospital care clinicians, we're having to manage so many conflicting demands. So first of all, the, we have a conflict within ourselves, you know, knowing what to say, when and how, that's a big skill in itself. But also, you know, we have all these other priorities, you know, uh, we're trying to make sure we're being clinically safe and effective. We have time restraints. Sometimes there's not enough of us. But also, um, um, quite often, uh, when I said about emotional distancing, it's understandable, you know, people won't perform as much emotional labor because it's draining, especially if you've had so many jobs, so many calls in a shift. Um, so sometimes, although we can say something extra or ask a further question, because of um, the strain people are already under in, as a self-protective measure for people's own emotional well-being, <laughs> People will sometimes distance themselves. Um, that's not right or wrong. It's just the way it is. Uh, we, and and um, just uh, elaborating on that a bit more, uh, the big thing about performing emotional labor is emotional involvement. It's this uh, dynamic between being detached and, and being distant um, uh, in order to look after yourself, but also do the clinical um, aspects well. But sometimes we don't have complete control or over that there will be certain instances where there's the patients families there might be a certain scene but sometimes we can't help with to, to identify and sympathize a bit more and i think again uh, people who have children for instance uh, and if they'll go to children they might stir those protective instincts and they may end up getting a bit more engaged and involved so um uh, and there, the final bullet point there is we all find different situations emotionally intense it's all relative to the individual um, so uh, this is a big dynamic, I think, ultimately. Um, so we have all these challenges and all these demands, but the big thing that we're negotiating is how involved that we become with people emotionally. It's important to maintain a balance, not only for them, for yourself, but for all the people as well. Uh, but it's, it's, it's not easy, but it does make care a lot more effective. Um, so just to, to summarise here, um, I think a lot of what I'm saying many people here I'm sure you resonate with what I'm saying it's important to as well as practitioners to be able to 
uh, do well and actually acknowledge and understand our patients and uh, respect and empathize with them and do our best but it's also important for uh, patients and their families themselves um, to be understood and just to be able to express themselves um, the big thing that I always want to highlight is we perform more than we realize we don't just provide clinical care we provide emotional labor I've provided a few examples, but there's so many more examples. But if there's one thing that I want people to take away is actually just to acknowledge and appreciate how much that we actually need more that we have to engage in uh, and that we're exposed to. And um, bottom line is we negotiate many challenges to to, to make this happen. Mm -hmm. um, so finally, uh, just moving on uh, to the last phase of the cycle, um, emotional processing. Um, now, emotional processing, um, many of you will be familiar with it in a, in a different gauge, in a different um, a banner and heading. It will probably come under, you know, what people will always talk about, health and well-being. Um, but bottom line uh, is emotional processing is addressing any emotional disturbances to continue working without disruption, i.e. trying to have some sense of emotional normality, stability. So it's, it's how we deal with our experience experiences uh the uh, how we deal with uh, the emotional labor in particular that we've been performing so i'll delve into a bit more about the definitions and levels of emotional processing just to highlight how it's a big part of our practice but uh, the challenges again that we experience um so firstly um it's important to just recognize again um the 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 impact of what we do um so i like this quote um, that I came across years ago um, um, about affect. But the expectation that we can be immersed in suffering and loss daily and not be touched by it is as unrealistic as expecting to be able to walk through water without getting wet. Um, I really love that quote because what it basically highlights is how there's so much that we do that we engage with and get involved with but expecting that it's not going to impact and shape us as people as who we are um it's unrealistic and it's unfair um what we'll do um uh, the, the the emotions that we experience and those that we express there's so much that we have to deal with and, and, and process um so it's important really that we acknowledge that and that acknowledgement is uh, improving um so this culture of stoicism that's existed for such a long time it is kind of withering away but it does still kind of linger and exist um, so here's my definition. The way I like to define emotional processing is dealing with feeling and giving it meaning. So in my definition, it's twofold. So when I say about dealing with feeling, it's the filter and flushing, you know, so having um, techniques and, and coping strategies just to be able to um, flush and release um um, or any negative energy and feelings that we may end up accumulating from all the encounters and the experiences that we'll have. Uh, but then the second part is uh, giving it meaning, uh, so reflection. We do reflections. I'm not a big fan of these reflection cycles, um, uh, but that, that, that's a side note. Um, but we, we, we will do debriefs. We'll, we'll think about uh, different patient encounters. But the bottom line when it comes to emotional processing is the meaning that we give any patient encounter will shape the impact it has on us thereafter. So, for example, um, the first cardiac arrest that I went to, um, um, it's, it ended up inspiring a lot of what I've done and continue to do. So, um, although it had a range of impacts initially because of the meaning that I've given it, it's actually had a lot of positive impact as well. Um, uh, so, so yeah, um, it's twofold is emotional processing. So the first thing just to I highlight and outline here is how, what we do during uh, is, um, any patient encounter will shape how we process it afterwards. It kind of, um, so especially because it's something that's highlighted a lot in the literature, but um, so this balance that I talked about uh, between uh, emotional connection and distancing, but more of the level of control that we have over this shapes our experiences of emotional processing. What do I mean about that? 
so we, uh, we had a patient encounter we're performing emotional labor and during that patient encounter if we felt like we had no control that we ended up getting just too emotionally involved or too distant and it's not something that we are aware of conscious of that can actually affect us quite a bit when it comes to that processing phase afterwards like oh um that that uh, i was I, I didn't know what i was doing then or um or so, or there could be some confusion, or there could be some sense of guilt. Um, but yeah, power, uh, elaborating on that a bit more uh, when speaking about a lot of the literature. So when you're highly attuned or detached, and you have a lack of control, it can lead to these range of feelings that you have to process: so feeling helpless, pain, frustration, fear, uh, self blame. Um, but yeah. Um, Again, there's that dynamic and uh, the level of control, so uh, power and how emotionally involved uh, are really important when it comes to processing. Now, um, uh, there's two levels here. Um, um, so we will going to talk about in terms of internal and external factors. So firstly, emotional processes, it, processing is shaped by what's going on internally, so our capacities and capabilities, um, so what strategies we already have, uh, life experience experiences like I talked about before but then uh, the second level which I will uh, briefly touch upon but it's going to be a big focus of part two is uh, external factors and external levels so the institutional setting the culture the norms of values policies etc these really shape how we uh, practice and experience emotional processing so firstly uh, when it comes to that internal level strategies a uh, big thing about emotional processing is adopting strategies uh, um, that uh, the so the challenge that we have right now is uh, trying to have these strategies that are reliable that don't disrupt life away from work uh, but this is a challenge um, a lot of the literature will talk about uh, uh, in strategies that are usually effective um, they'll address the root emotion and problem they usually um, uh, enable you know positive outcomes so what I mean by a positive outcome where people People have been able to uh, process it to the point where it's not affecting them so much and they can go back into work or go back to a similar job and perform that well. Uh, the challenge that we have is when we've not got strategies that are effective, they can end up uh, taking form of avoiding the problem, uh, not really adapting uh, because of the experience that we've had, or people even punishing themselves because they didn't do something well. And these can have massive consequences. We're talking about impairing our work balances, um, conflicts of breakdown within the workplace, outside workplace. We've got extreme examples of stress, anxiety, depression, um, suicide, getting, uh, growing recognition, and then there's poor work performance as well. Uh, and then finally, just to touch upon um, uh, uh, the external level of emotional processing, uh, it's the whole institutional infrastructure. Um, in order to be able to do emotional processing, we really need those measures of support at system level. But the problem, the challenge that quite often uh, we experience is um, a lack of time and space, you know, for um, uh, emotional processing. Uh, so, for example, you get a lot of other uh, professions where they have supervision. Wouldn't it be great if we could have something like that in pre-hospital care where, you know, every couple of months uh, you decide to sit down and you can just talk about the emotional aspects of the jobs that you've had. The other thing is emotional denial. Um, so not actually uh, acknowledging, recognising all these different dynamics. Um, so again, it's not really uh, recognised and understood enough, both in theory and practice. And then also a, a lack of concern for well-being in the workplace, you know, uh, not only in terms of a workplace culture in, in many settings, but also those day-to-day -day work interactions where other things end up taking priority rather than uh, the well-being and performance of people. So just to summarise here, um, uh, in terms of emotional processing, but more of it in pre-hospital care, practitioners are affected emotionally by what they are exposed to and experience. Uh, that, that's that's a given, and it's really important. You can acknowledge that. Um, and um, right now, there's a heavy reliance on people to develop their own techniques, measures, and strategies, often away from work, so people are having to draw upon their life experiences. <laughs> 
this is a huge challenge right now and something that needs to change uh, going forward. So just to summarise, uh, just this is just a quick uh, summary from um, the, the, the research that I did initially that led me on to this. But the bottom line is um, uh, if people have got issues and challenges um, at, uh, during each phase, before, during and after um, uh, an encounter uh, with the emotional aspects you know, people can end up in a vicious cycle so if you don't feel prepared uh, you're not going to perform emotional labor well um, that's going to lead to a lot of emotional trauma and because a patient encounter hasn't gone well emotionally that will mean there's so much that needs to be processed but if people haven't been able to process that cycle will continue and continue and things can accumulate to the point where people are becoming unwell so not only with their emotional well-being but their performance at work and uh, as we'll talk about more in part two it can have a lot of effects so, uh, outside of work I have to look to examples in our own practice uh, for this with certain jobs but if people go to a job where they feel prepared um, and they have been able to prepare for it well in that before phase and then have a good balance where um, they were able to mediate that uh, uh, being uh, connected and then detached uh, you know, with the patients, families, etc. get a good rapport, uh, but also feel like they were in control of that during phase, then it, quite often it means that they can process things well a lot more effectively. Um, and uh, just to highlight here, uh, in practice, you can have vicious and virtuous phases in in the cycle, but sometimes all it takes is one intense vicious phase to disrupt well-being and performance. Um, yeah, I think that explains itself. Uh, so just to summarise, um, emotions are fundamental to paramedic practice, just to pre-hospital care in general. Uh, they, um, so uh, in order to perform well, we need to be well and vice versa, which is why it's so important. It needs to get more recognition and understanding. Um, and uh, emotions, they're affected by what happens before and after a patient encounters. It's not just what happens during. And there's a need for change at uh, the system level. Because right now, uh, I think a lot of emphasis and a lot of the language, a lot of the discourse is always on the individuals. Um, so people are expected to go away, do more, change things for themselves, whereas there also needs to be change at a, a wider level. That is starting to happen, uh, but there's still a lot of way, way to go, but we'll look at that a bit more in part two. Um, if anyone wants to uh, follow on anything, if anything has triggered them, uh, here's a range of resources that uh, you can reach out to um, and you can also get in touch. Uh, but that's it. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for tuning in, for listening in. Uh, I'm really grateful for your time. Um, and uh, I know we've only got a couple of minutes left, but if anyone's got any questions, we'll see what we can do. If not, we can follow up afterwards if you just get in touch. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, very thorough. And as we said, it, you know, it's it's important to to look after. And I think Richard Williams actually said it once in his webinar a couple of months ago. You know, if people aren't looking after the medics, then there's no one to look after the patients at the end of the day. So it's it's such an important side of practice more than anything. Absolutely. Uh, so I'm just going to share yeah. my screen. No, I'm not. Yes, I am. There we go. And that's worked. It has normally. It doesn't, and it's worked for the first time ever, everyone. Brilliant. So as uh, Spazine mentioned, we do have part two coming up as well on, uh, oh, it's not on October the 31st at all. It's on November the 3rd, I want to say, off the top of my head. 13th. 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 Yes. There was a three in there. There was a three in there. I've accidentally yeah. left it. The wrong thing so ignore that but the qr code that's on your screen does take you through to sign up to part two I've, that's definitely working just ignore october the 31st it's it's definitely on the wednesday november the 13th it's another wednesday that we've got going on uh for that so and everyone's saying thank you in the talk detailed and interesting and uh many thanks see you for the next session so everyone, someone's already signed up which is what we love to see so yes do sign up for part two nice. if you enjoyed part one where we'll delve even further into the emotions in pre-hospital care 
But just before we move on, I just want to draw attention. I was speaking about this just during that has got Thursday, so you can see where I went wrong, can't you? Um, just draw attention to the next webinar that is coming up, which is next week. Now, this is a webinar that is, I'm sure, many people um, who are in the uh, who are in the chat and with us tonight will say this, but this for me particularly is a webinar that's very very close to my heart. Um, I live literally around the corner from the MAM when it happened. So, and I was with. Um, Martin's best friend two days later um, after this event happened. So if you do want to join us next mm -hmm. Thursday on October the 31st, um, we do have Fegan Murray OBE joining us, who is Martin's head mother, to talk about Martin's law and how what happened in Manchester has led her to create such a legislative change that he's gone through its second reading parliament just last week as well. So do scan the QR code that's on your screen now if you want to join us for what is going to be an incredibly emotional but important webinar, because this change does have the potential to reflect and change your own practice as well. So you'll get some proper real from the person who created the law knowledge about how martin's law is going to affect practice especially when it comes to large-scale events from anything over 200 people is now going to be classed as that um so yeah do join us then and as always if you have any questions i'll just pop open the q a box where's it gone i say i'm going to pop it open and it's completely disappeared on me that's not good It'll pop up in a second if it, if it does want to, if it does. Oh, there we go. Q&A box. Found it again. Fantastic. So if you do want to have a CPD certificate and you are not a member of Trauma Care, now is your chance to get one. Scan the QR code that's on your screen now, go through to the type form, fill it out, pay $1.99 and it'll be in your inbox within seconds. So that's only for people who are not members of Trauma Care. If you want to become a member of Trauma Care between now and sort of 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, you will be eligible for a certificate. So don't scan the QR code. Just go to traumacare.org.uk forward slash members to sign up now. Otherwise, scan the QR code and one will be with you very shortly. So a question has come in from Suzanne Thomas, who has asked, do you see a value in group reflective sessions? How can emotion be channeled for development rather than negativity? Yeah, brilliant question. Uh, firstly, uh, absolutely. Yeah, uh, group reflective sessions, I think there's huge value in them. So, uh, example, um, again, I know it's more clinical heavy, but uh, you'll get specialists, advanced paramedics, or even HEMS, uh, they'll do clinical governance days where they meet up so often. And although the emphasis is clinical, sometimes a lot of the non-clinical will come out of that. But um, um, even having sessions where there's a non-clinical emphasis, just toss those ideas and thoughts back and forth sometimes people may end up being like oh yeah i didn't realize that um or uh, it, it may just give them a different idea and perspective but also may reaffirm that you know that you're not the only one who's actually feeling like that there are other people who are feeling that way and it's a great way just to um build teamwork and uh, just to learn from one another so absolutely i think there's huge value and opportunity in group reflective sessions and it's a it's a good way uh, i think something that needs to be done more going forward um and there are a lot of organizations that are actually trying to develop that by creating a, a team kind of environment um and what was the second part of the question uh, this just um it was how it's gonna how emotions can be channeled for development rather, development than, rather than negativity. Yeah, yeah um, I think uh, the big thing is um, looking at emotions as lessons. Like, uh, I'm a big fan of quotes, and there's you know there's a quote that I always goes, uh, you know, not a mistake, always a lesson. Um, I, but I think um, if if instead of looking at thing, emotions as something to be avoided, that uh, there, there's something that will actually give you a message and um, and Therefore, if you just uh, channel it as uh, an opportunity for learning, uh, then I think it, that will switch from being uh, something negative and more about development. Uh, but I, I think uh, part two, we'll, we'll talk about this a bit more. I think a big part of that is the culture. If we have a culture where we're really looking at uh, emotions as uh, a, a good thing, a good part, of, a big part of our practice, and then also for learning, then people will be able to embrace that more, and they could actually shape and inform our development a lot more better. Um, so, yeah, in a nutshell, um, I think just looking at them as opportunities for learning. 
Perfect. Thank you. Very succinct and very true answer as well. Very, very well answered there. Thank you very much. Um, so no other questions seems to have popped in, but I say this every single week. And as I click onto the next slide, something always comes in. So I'm just going to move along. And if anything comes in as I'm doing this outro, then we'll go right back to the, uh, to the, to the question and pop into it. So before we leave tonight, of course, I do have to give a big thank you to the wonderful QualSafe. Uh, they've helped us actually put together the Scottish Trauma Care Conference, which is happening next week, as well as putting together the first aid programme that's happening at the 27th. Yes, 27th annual conference, which is happening next March. So really good friends of ours. They've got some wonderful CPD resources over on their website, as well as lots of first aid courses, FREC4 courses, all sorts of wonderful, wonderful things. So scan the QR code that's on your screen now to find out more. And of course, thank you to Galen, who have been long-standing partners, probably our longest-standing partners um, of, of Trauma Care for now. We are great friends with them. I love seeing Bronner at all the events. They, uh, I don't think they're coming to Scotland, but they will be coming to the FIT course, I believe. So do scan the QR code that's on your screen now. Find out more about all the pharmaceuticals that they have available. There's a special section on their website, which is for medical professionals, because it goes into the, the lingo and the mumbo-jumbo that I don't understand, but you guys do. So... Thank you to them. And of course, before we leave, thank you to you all as well for your continuous support of trauma care. We know that times are a little bit tough at the moment. There's a bit of apathy and a little bit of a uh, little bit of sort of, as, as we've been speaking about tonight, difficulty going around within the NHS and within the medical community for, for mental health. But the fact that you guys turn up week in, week out really, really, really does help us and makes my heart swell as well. So thank you very much. And of course, the biggest thank you tonight goes to you. Thank you for putting together such a comprehensive wonderful talk we are very much looking forward to part two can't wait for it to, to come on on november the 13th and we hope to see you all there as well so as always no matter where you are in the world take care of yourselves take care of your loved ones thank you very much and good night all thank you goodbye <laughs>